This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome back to VAM 2019. We are lucky enough to have Dr. Michael Conti. He's a professor of surgery and co-director of the UCSF Heart and Vascular Center. And he's the chief of the division of vascular and endovascular surgery at UCSF. Dr. Conti is the lead author on the Global Vascular Guidelines on the Management of Chronic Limb-Threatening Ischemia, just published this month in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, June 2019. All right, Dr. Conti, welcome to Audible Bleeding. Um, in regards to these new guidelines, can you speak to us a little bit about the process of developing a guideline system like this? Yes, this was the first um, international vascular society consensus guideline uh, where the SVS partnered with the European Society for Vascular Surgery as well as the World Federation for Vascular Societies, which each represent multiple other national societies in a collaborative process to review the evidence and develop a joint guideline on the treatment of chronic limb-threatening ischemia, which is a major global public health problem. So what did you feel the need was for developing these guidelines? I mean, I think around around the world, people are seeing a growing um, population of patients with a whole range of limb-threatening problems based on the aging population as well as the epidemiology of diabetes. Um, and uh, on top of that, so there's a tremendous amount of variation in practice. There's a various variation in the types of specialists who initially encounter these patients and how they get referred. There's a lot of heterogeneity in um, both medical and vascular practice in relation to these patients and a lot of cost. Um, so there's, I think, a growing consensus that the problem is expanding, that um, it's often the care of these patients are, is very uh, fragmented and not organized and it lacks um, definitions or standards of care and definitions of expected outcomes and evidence a synthesis uh, to, to guide treatment in the field. So I think there's a, a sense that um, we need to restart in terms of establishing a decision-making framework, even though the evidence for many of the decisions we need to make is still somewhat lacking. And in addition to the vascular societies, what, was there any involvement in the non-vascular surgeons who treat these conditions? There's involvement of non-vascular surgeons in, in the writing group. Um, we have representation from uh, interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists, vascular medicine and podiatrists, as well as vascular surgeons. The sponsoring societies, however, are the vascular societies. The guidelines were then subsequently endorsed by multiple other societies around the world, uh, including a whole range of cardiovascular, interventional, and podiatric societies. So this is basically an 100 pages or so of, of guidelines for the residents and fellows out there listening. What, what should they go to? What part of this should they look at? What is going to be practice changing? So there's a number of things in here that are that are practice changing, and there'll be more coming out that simplify the messaging, including pocket guides, executive summaries, and some mobile apps to facilitate the process. So the first key is to reestablish who the patient population is. The old nomenclature based on the Rutherford scheme of classifying peripheral artery disease, where critical ischemia is defined as some magical threshold of perfusion measurement is not felt to represent the modern state where vascular specialists are often referred patients with a whole range of, of ischemia and wounds that do reflect different uh, risks for amputation. So we're endorsing the Wi-Fi staging system as a more broad way of staging the risk of the limb to patients who present with various degrees of tissue loss and varying degrees of impaired perfusion. So first is to employ non-invasive hemodynamic assessments and better staging to characterize the urgency of these patients uh, and who is appropriately referred directly for vascular intervention or who can be treated initially with wound care. So that's an important key message. The second is in terms of thinking about evidence-based revascularization. I think that the guideline seeks to develop a framework 
uh, for an evidence-based selective approach to revascularization, which gets us a little bit away from what we feel has been a lesion-based technology-driven mentality, where patients were looked at as lesions first. Um, we are reestablishing the concept of what we call plan, which starts with the patient, assessing the patient risk, and then moves to the limb, staging of the limb, how severely threatened is the limb, and then ends with anatomy last in terms of the complexity of the vascular anatomy. So establishing the appropriate framework which evaluates patient risk, limb threat, and anatomy puts things in the right framework, and so what I expect my residents to do. You know, we don't start by looking at what the lesion is. We start by looking at the patient as a whole and having then a limb-centered approach about what's the best approach to save this limb at this moment in time. And last, we focus on the anatomy. And in the anatomy phase, we have a new system in place that's in the guideline, which is a contrast to a segment or lesion-based approach. It actually integrates the complexity of disease from the groin to the foot, which is how actually vascular surgeons really do look at angiograms. They don't look one lesion at a time and decide what the treatment strategy is. They look at the whole picture and decide what is it going to take to get straight line flow to the foot. Um, so in order to do that, you know, you really need to think about What's the complexity of disease from an endovascular standpoint? And you can group these, these patterns of disease more like coronary disease instead of one lesion at a time, but into risk categories. So low complexity, intermediate complexity, and high complexity disease. And when you do that, I think you can create a selective strategy for who should get endovascular first and who might be better served by an open bypass immediately. No, I think this is fantastic. I mean, I, you know, Clinical judgment, you get a senior experienced vascular surgeon, they can sort of look at a patient and, and, and make a gestalt, but this sort of codifies that and, and gives insight to that. And I think that the, this is, this will be a very helpful tool. Um, and, uh, you say that there are going to be some apps or, or, yep. or, or what, what's the timeline for the release of that? Yeah. So there's, so what, there already is an app for Wi Fi that's available that we're encouraging people to use in practice. Uh, two more apps that will be coming out from the guideline. The first is, for the anatomy staging system, which is called GLASS for Global Limb Anatomic Staging System. You'll be able to, in real time, uh, input or answer several questions about the location, uh, the length, and the severity of disease from the origin of the SFA to the ankle. And it will populate that for you and, and spit out, basically, is this a low, intermediate, or high complexity pattern of disease? As a, as a piece of information to determine on the overall grid of decision making, right? Then the third piece is a patient risk calculator, because that is critical. And that will also allow us, allow you to estimate based on VQI data. It's generated from 40,000 VQI data points for patients who underwent both PVI or bypass for advanced limb ischemia. It'll allow you to estimate 30 day as well as two year survival. And so with that, we've basically suggested that a patient should be considered high risk if their perioperative mortality is expected to be greater than 5% and their two-year survival is expected to be less than 50%. Um, so we're grouping people into low average and high risk based on that. So that app will also come out. And those are just tools meant to facilitate individual informed decision-making with patients. Um, we don't have level one evidence for any of these scenarios specifically, we have best available evidence, which does suggest that certain patients should probably be getting one or the other first. But this reflects more of kind of the paradigm that we have in coronary disease, where people understand what it means to have one, two, and three vessel disease with or without a bad heart. Um, and, there, and everybody doesn't get the same approach, right? So that's what PAD needs, and that's what the, these, these approaches are attempting to do. Dr. Cundy, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. I know these guidelines went out with this most recent copy of uh, uh, Journal of Vascular Surgery, and so hopefully everybody has a chance to, at minimum, look through that and hopefully read the whole thing, and we'll get some links to that uh, along with some of these apps on the, on the website. Thank great. you very much. All right, great. Thanks, guys. I'd just like to let our audience know of a way to support our podcast. Our team is committed to providing free, high-quality, unbiased content to our listeners. We currently do not take any funding from industry sponsors or advertising, and we hope to keep it that way. So if you want to help us keep bringing you great content, go to audiblebleeding.com support and find out how. We'll put a link in our show notes.